Michelle Akers was in third grade when her teacher, Mrs. Erickson, laid down the law. Well, her law. Girls can't play football. They can't play in the NFL. And I was like, well, yes, they can. Ever since she was a little girl, Michelle had known exactly who she wanted to be when she grew up. Me and Joe Green. I loved him. I had his jersey. I wanted to be him. I dreamed about it. I thought about it. I practiced. Mean Joe Green, he played defense for the Pittsburgh Steelers from 1969 to 1981. It was his job to stop the Steelers' opponents, by any means necessary. And by all accounts, he loved to hit as hard as he could. Mr. Green? Mr. Green? Yeah. He's also the star of an iconic Coca-Cola commercial. Want my Coke? No, no. Really? You can have it. Okay. Thanks. Mean Joe was six foot four, two hundred and seventy-five pounds. Michelle Akers, on the other hand, was a curly-haired third grader living in Santa Clara, California, and she had already gotten in trouble with Mrs. Erickson. The problem was PE class. You see, Mrs. Erickson had rules. Girls would go to the park. Boys could go play kickball or do baseball or whatever. And I, I, I just, I was like this. I hate going to the park. We should be able to choose, right? So I boycotted. One day, instead of playing in the park with the rest of the girls, Michelle sat on a bench and refused to move until she was allowed to play kickball. Mrs. Erickson was not pleased. She's like, well, I'm going to give you five minutes. If you're not out there, I'm sending you to the principal's office. Five minutes later, Michelle hadn't moved, and Mrs. Erickson was true to her word. The principal ended up siding with Michelle, and from that moment on, she was allowed to play kickball with the boys. But that was just the start of her troubles with Mrs. Erickson. It was sharing day, you know, and oh, I just remember being so excited because I brought my football, I wore my Mean Joe Green jersey, and I was super, super shy. Um, So to get up there in front of the class was a huge deal. And then Mrs. Erickson goes, no, Michelle, they girls do not play football and girls do not play in the NFL. And I was like, well, yes, they can. Once again, Michelle was sent to see the principal. And I was so scared. I remember sitting in that chair like, oh my gosh, crying. That guy's going to get in so much trouble. When Michelle's mom arrived, she took her daughter by the hand and led her into the office. And she said, how dare you tell my daughter what she can and cannot do. How dare you? And so I've kind of always had that, like, how dare someone tell me that I cannot do something? Many years later, in 1989, Michelle Akers would get the chance to try out to become the first woman to play in the NFL. She was invited to a clinic held by the Dallas Cowboys kicking coach. But at that point, she found something she loved way more than football. I told him, no thanks, I I wanted to play soccer. Over the years, Michelle sometimes regretted the decision to give up her childhood dream for a sport that didn't even have a world championship. But her regret wouldn't last long because women's sports were on the rise and Michelle Akers was about to become soccer's first female superstar. From Dear Media and Together, I'm Michelle Kwan, and this is Summer of Gold. This is episode two, Title IX Babies. By the time Dot Richardson was 10 years old, she understood what it meant to be a girl who was good at sports. I know what the most frustrating thing in life is, and that is to have been given talent and a gift and not have the opportunity to express that talent. Dot dreamed of one day becoming a major league pitcher. But because she was a girl, she wasn't even allowed to play Little League. I had to watch my brothers play and our friends, who, by the way, the guys didn't have a problem with me. They picked me first for pickup games after school. But society had said, too bad, you're good at athletics and a girl. You cannot play on any organized team. So one day, my brother gets a brand new catcher's mitt before his Little League game. And he asked me to break it in. As Dot and her brother were playing catch, a baseball game was finishing up on a nearby field. And one of the head coaches came over and said, wow, you got a great arm. How would you like to play on my Little League baseball team? 
And right away, I knew my, my prayers are being answered. I'm going to become a major league baseball pitcher. And then in practically the same breath, he said, well, we're going to have to cut your hair really short and give you a boy's name. We're going to call you Bob. My whole life, it's been too bad you're born a girl and good at sports, right? And I can't believe that I was strong enough really to say this. And I said, sir, thank you, but no thank you. If I have to hide who I am, I just don't feel it's right. Dot decided to walk over to a different baseball field. And on the way, I found a friend of mine, Sunday Brown, and she wanted to play baseball catch, right? That's all we knew was baseball. Dot and Sunday found a big empty field and started playing catch. But their game was interrupted. This other coach comes walking up to us and says, wow, you got a great arm. Do you have a minute to talk to the head coach? And I was like, yeah, for sure. And as I'm heading from right field towards the infield, my first thought was, oh my gosh, deja vu. But this time, as Dot made her way towards first base, she saw a group of women in the infield, stretching and getting ready to play. And when the head coach walked over, Dot was shocked. It wasn't a man, it was a woman. And she said, have you ever played softball? I was like, no, what is it? Oh, it's just like baseball, but the ball's a little bigger. Get on third base, take a few ground balls. And as I'm taking these ground balls, I feel like I belong. And then the head coach calls me over and she says, how would you like to play for our fast pitch softball team? And I was like, yes, you know, I mean, I know the ball's a little bigger, I'd love to. And then she said, well, how old are you anyway? And I looked at her and I said, well, I'm 10 years old. The average age of the team was 22. She got that look like she was gonna die. Like, you know, like parents are gonna say no. And she said, well, we're gonna have to go and talk to your mom and dad. We reflect on that day and my parents would always say, I can't believe that we said yes. Dot's friend Sunday Brown didn't join the softball team, but the next year when Title IX came into effect in our neighborhood of Union Park, right outside of Orlando, Sunday Brown became the first girl to ever play Little League Baseball in our area. Title IX was a big deal for the women of the 96 Olympics. They're sometimes called Title IX babies. I am a Title IX baby, proudly so. That's Julie Foudy. She played on the U.S. women's national soccer team from 1987 to 2004. Her teammates called her Loudy Foudy. You'll understand why soon. Julie had the chance to meet Senator Birch Bayh. He helped craft Title IX, which guarantees girls and women equal access to sports and education. Senator Bayh had seen the effects of gender discrimination up close when his wife was denied admission to the University of Virginia. It was her dream school. She was the smarter of the two of them. And he's like, how is that possible? She had better test scores and I'm the one getting admitted and she can't even get in. And he's like, we knew something had to change right then. Title IX wasn't originally intended to give girls equal access to sports. Senator Bai told Julie that it was written to give them equal access to education. I was like, wow, so the sports were the fine print. He's like, yes. Had it been the focus, it would have never passed. Like, that is insane. When Julie joined the national team in 1987, the team already had a star. Her name was Michelle Akers. Mm, Akers. She was a beast. That's what made her such a force. We called her Mufasa after the Lion King because she had this curly hair and this mane. And she was literally, she played like a lion. She lives like a lion. There was nothing Michelle could not do. She was tall. She was athletic. She was fast. She was skillful. She was great in the air. She was great from distance. And typically, players get a few of those gifts. You never check all the boxes of, I, yep, I got every one. Yeah, I, I can do that too. And it almost seemed unfair. To this day, it pains me if a kid does not know who Michelle Akers is because she is a giant in this game. Michelle Akers didn't start out as a giant. She didn't even start out playing soccer. First, her mom signed her up for ballet and Bluebirds, a program similar to Girl Scouts. 
I boycotted ballet and the bluebirds I got in a fight, so I got kicked out. Michelle was eight years old when the first soccer league for girls was formed in her town. Her team was called the Cougars, and their uniforms were yellow and pink. Worse than a nightmare come true. And we lost every single game, every single game, you know, 20 to zero, 12 to zero. And I was goalkeeper, so it was like, oh, just, you know, run me over another 8,000 times. No game was fun. And the pink thing was just, you know, the frosting on the cake of all that was bad about that whole experience. So my first year was, I hated, I hated soccer. I hated it. But that didn't last long. The next year, Michelle left those pink uniforms behind and moved to Seattle. There, she had even more opportunities to play soccer. And soon enough, she found herself loving everything about the game. Still, Michelle didn't have any idea what her future would hold. And it wasn't until college that I realized, oh my, oh my gosh, I, I am really good. So I, a little slow, a little slow there. Michelle Akers was really good. In 2000, she'd be named FIFA's Player of the Century. But like Dot Richardson, Michelle had been born before Title IX, and she was going to need more than a little patience before she'd get a chance to show the world just how good she was. When 10-year-old Dot Richardson joined the women's fast-pitch softball team, her teammates recognized her talent right away. They didn't care how little I was, what my size was, my age, was I good enough to play? Just a couple of years later, Dot left that team to join the semi-pro Orlando Rebels as a bad girl. One day, Dot got more than she bargained for. The Orlando Rebels are beating an Alabama team 10 to zero. And as coach, you know, looks in the dugout and she says dot get into the game i was like what uh, is this legal you know as a bat girl she's like yeah you're on the official roster so she puts me in right field i get up to bat with a runner on second base i get a base hit the runner on second base rounds third and scores i get an rbi run batted in at first base coach gives me a steal i steal second base Next batter gets up, gets a base hit, I round third, and score a run. In right field, I get a routine fly ball, no big deal. But then I get a line shot, I scooped up and threw the girl out at first base to end the ball game. After the game, Dot went back to her Batgirl duties. But the next year, I was asked to play for the Orlando Rebels and became the youngest girl ever to play. Dot had a bigger dream, but as good as she was, that dream was out of reach. I always wanted to be an Olympian. Right in high school, I played volleyball, basketball, softball, track and field, loved them all. And everyone thought I chose the wrong sport because all the other sports got into the Olympics. Softball had been lobbying for Olympic inclusion for decades. There were times when the sport came close, like in 1986, when baseball was announced as a medal sport for the Barcelona Games. Softball was supposed to get in with baseball as an exhibition sport, but we didn't. Only baseball did. For Dot, that vote marked the end of the road. She was scheduled to graduate from medical school in 1993, and then she'd need to complete her internship and residency for orthopedic surgery. When would she have time for softball? So I didn't think it was even possible. So Dot figured that when her medical school ended, so would her tenure with the U.S. national team. While Dot was in medical school, Michelle Akers, Julie Foudy, and the women's soccer team were just starting out on the world stage. In 1991, FIFA was preparing to hold the first Women's World Cup. Only, they didn't call it that. How dare you call the first ever Women's World Cup the World Cup because that would compete with the Men's World Cup. So we were the m and Cup. That's Julie Foudy again. <laughs> oh, God. Even thinking about it today, I'm like, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. I ate more M&Ms in that year than maybe I did in COVID. Julie invited her parents, but her dad took some convincing. 
True story. He's like, honey, that's a really busy time for me. I'm like, dad, it's a World Cup. I know you don't follow soccer, but it's kind of a big deal. The tournament was being held in China, and it was a big deal. Every corner of every street was like a, a fountain made of flowers of, you know, of a player or... I mean, it was insane. You know, the logo, you know, on floats with roses. It just was everywhere we went and crowds everywhere we went and TV cameras. And literally my parents who knew nothing about soccer or World Cups, they were even like, what the heck is all this? This is amazing. Oh my gosh, we had no idea. I was like, I know, either did we. Michelle Akers was there too. And she brought her A game. We just kicked ass. The mentality we had was so tough. And so we we won. We ended up winning in this incredible, you know, fairy tale fashion and became the first world champions. We thought as the Americans and especially when we won it that it would transform the sport for women. What we didn't realize is that was not being broadcast anywhere else, at least not in the United States. So no one back home, and this is obviously pre-social media, pre-the internet, no one back home knew anything about what we'd been doing. The team thought they would be walking into a sea of fans at the airport. But when they arrived, they were greeted by one U.S. soccer official, the team's bus driver, and a couple of reporters. After that, Julie returned to her studies at Stanford. My Stanford professors were like, where have you been? You have finals to take. Sit down. You have two hours. I was like, wait, what? But let me let me tell you about where I've been. And they're like, no, it doesn't matter. Two hours. Knock when you're done. So, yeah, it did not have the impact we were hoping. But in typical fashion, you know, that group of women was like, OK, let's go then. It's our chance to show the world still. So roll up your sleeves. Let's get to it. The team had their work cut out for them because selling women's soccer to a worldwide audience was not going to be an easy task. Initially, it was like, good, we have 10 media people out at our games, you know, Portugal or Europe or whatever. But sometimes those media people would ask Michelle things like, does your husband let you play? I'm like, what? (laughs) Does your wife let you come interview women soccer players? Like, but... We couldn't say those things. It was like experiencing Mrs. Erickson all over again, all over the world, right? So it was crazy. The team knew that to get the respect they deserved, especially at home, they'd need to play in the Olympic Games. World Cups are obviously for a soccer player. They're your pinnacle of your career. But we also understood that with Olympics, Americans would care. Right. And we had to sell the game in our home country. We had to convince people that this was a sport that's valuable, that you should spend money on, that you should spend broadcast rights fees on, that you should spend sponsorship dollars on. So Julie, Michelle and the rest of the women's national soccer team had two jobs. They had to play soccer better than anyone else in the world. And they had to serve as ambassadors for their sport. Michelle Akers joined a letter-writing campaign. Every week, she'd send another letter to the head of the International Olympic Committee. Dear whoever the name of the president was, we please put women's soccer, we've done this and that, there's these teams. So it was a constant push and push and push. Until one day in September of 1993. I got a letter back that says, we can't ignore you anymore, you're in. So stop writing us, basically. By this time, softball had already been announced as an official medal sport at the 1996 Atlanta Olympic Games. Now, women's soccer would join them. But first, the teams would need to be selected, and there was one aspiring orthopedic surgeon who was eager to make the cut. The day that's burned into Dot Richardson's memory came in 1993. Well, it was actually match day, which means it's the day when I knew after all my interviews for my residency, I had to list them 
in order of where I wanted to go. You give it to a receptionist, you know, at your medical school, one of the assistants, and she puts it into the computer that's a national database, and they match. Dot knew her residency would take five years, and the Olympics were coming up in three. Well, I almost didn't want to let go of that paperwork because I'm like, I knew for sure we're in the Olympics in three years, right? And the tryouts would begin right away and the selection of the team would be in two years. So I'm like, oh my gosh. And I just gave it to the Lord. Dot handed in her paperwork. It meant she would miss out on her Olympic dream. They walked back to my apartment on the answer machine and it said from USC, welcome to the Olympics of orthopedics. And I was like, does he know that softball's in the Olympics? i like, what does this mean, right? And I just was like, I have to go for my childhood dream. Dot didn't know how she could possibly finish her surgical residency and play in the Olympics, but she knew she had to try. Two years later, Dot still hadn't told anyone at her surgical residency about her Olympic dreams. She was in Los Angeles, and the national team tryouts were nearly 2,000 miles away in St. Louis, Missouri. I had a couple rotations. I was like, wow, I'm going to fly out across the country, and I'm going to try out and see what happens. Dot managed to sneak away and participate in the tryouts. As far as she knew, she had gotten away with it. But... Someone from Sports Illustrated took a picture of me at shortstop throwing the ball across the infield. Dot's secret was out. I got called into the office and my chairman, Dr. Pat Zakis, said, well, the board wants to give you a one year leave of absence to go for your childhood dream of Olympic gold. And all of the guys in the residency program were like, whatever you need, you got to go for it. I'll cover your shifts, whatever it needs to be. And I was like shocked and I was like, oh, my gosh, what if I don't make the team? It's probably not going to come as much of a surprise, but Dr. Dot Richardson made the 1996 Olympic softball team. It was the realization of a dream she'd had for a very long time. When I was seven years old, I saw the Olympics for the first time in my life. That was back in 1968 when the Olympics were being held in Mexico City. And it was on TV, black and white TV. That's when you had to go over and turn the knob yourself, not a remote. One night, Dot and her family were watching track and field. And I saw a pole vaulter for the United States go over a bar. And when he landed, he looked up and he reached up because he realized the bar hadn't fallen and he had captured the Olympic gold medal. That night, I went to bed and had a dream that I was standing on a podium and bent down, Olympic gold medal was put around my neck. When she finally got the chance to live her Olympic dream, Dot was 34 years old. She had missed holidays and birthdays with friends and family. She had put her career as an orthopedic surgeon on hold, and she knew what she had to do. I had been waiting my whole life for this, and I was going to live every single moment. But Dot Richardson wouldn't be alone. She'd be joined by 272 other Title IX babies, American women who had benefited from the 1972 landmark law that guaranteed equal access to sports and education. These women were finally getting the opportunity to show the world what female athletes could do, and they weren't going to waste it. Coming up on Summer of Gold, the U.S. women's basketball team embarks on a nine-month barnstorming tour with head coach Tara Vanderveer at the helm. That year was not an easy year. I I mean, Tara made it really hard. There were times when we were training, I was like, oh, no. Like, seriously, about Tara, I was like, this woman has lost her mind. <laughs> they understood that there there might be a place for them to play after this. They understood there might be more than one place for them to play after this. I think they felt a fair amount of pressure. Meanwhile, the soccer team runs into some trouble. And I said, as we got in there, I said, we are not signing this effing contract. They can F off. And that was the start of our fight. You know, the days and the weeks drew out afterwards, but that was to be expected. If we break apart, then we will falter. But if we stay together, it's, you know, they can't not bring an entire team. What are they going to do? 